may not happen. Okay, so um, <coughs> okay, so the, the, the climax of the course, um, the theorem of Ascoli Arzala, and maybe we'll also do Stone Bar's Okay, so it's um, kind of compactness, a kind of compactness result, right? You have a bunch of functions, and you're trying to um, you, you're trying to find some conditions that guarantee a uniformly convergent subsequence. Okay, so here they. <coughs> <coughs> here, here it goes. So um, you have a sequence of uh, complex value functions on some set K, um, and you know. Uh, so if the set is compact, um, if uh, the functions are pointwise bounded, on K and um, three, the set uh, is equicontinuous. Then, in fact, um, <coughs> uh, what you want to happen happens. Fn has a uniformly a uniformly convergent subsequence. And uh, another thing happens as well, Fn turns out to be uh, uniformly bounded on K. So this is um, you know, you know, the analog of the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem, which said that if you have you know a, a sequence of points, a bounded sequence of points in in R n, then you have a you have a convergent subsequence. So you've got this sort of somehow you've got some sort of bounded uh, collection of functions, and you get a uniformly convergent subsequence. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> So we'll do this in two parts. Um, first, we'll go for uh, uniform boundedness. OK, so um, in my notes, it says it's easy. And I have this picture. That's it. So um, <laughs> <laughs> we did that on the test. <laughs> yeah, if your name is Shin Mochizuki, then <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, so that's the clue. That's the clue. Uh, got these three points here. Okay, so um, we want, want to show that it's uniform bounded, um, uniformly bounded. So fix an epsilon, fix an epsilon, and we'll use um, equicontinuity, right? That is our the you know the the, the, the thing that we said was going to help us so much. Um, so by equicontinuity, by equicontinuity, we know that there exists a delta such that um, <coughs> right, uh, whenever the distance between two points is less than less than delta, we have the distance between Fnx and Fny smaller than epsilon, right? And that works for all, right, for all x, y in your set, and for all x, y, k, and for all n. Okay. Okay, so who can tell me what's gonna happen next? What are we gonna do? Right, we've controlled how much this thing can, how much this thing can vary, right, right. So, who knows what we're gonna do? Maybe I have an idea. We've got a compact set. We're trying to show that all all the functions we can find a bound that bounds all the functions. Right. 
Anybody have an idea? Well, I guess since it's a, a compact set, you yeah. can kind of use the bounds of the compact set to say that since f of n is in the compact set, then f of n has those bounds as well. Say it again. Um, I mean, it's true that K is compact, right? K is compact, yeah. So you can find an M so that this point M is outside of the set, outside of the compact set, right? Because it's finite, the compact set is finite. So then that point M can be used as a bound on F of N because F of N can't be outside the set. We can find something outside the set. So that's something bounds F of N. Uh, I mean, I think what you're like trying to say is that each of these each of these functions is bounded, right? But that's, I mean, that's that's true. But uh, Adam, um, I was thinking that you could, uh, since x and l, x and y can only be so far apart because uh, because k is compact, um, and because of that, you can kind of. Uh, uh, um, you, you, uh, using the, this, this delta and epsilon, like, you, like there's going to be like a finite, like, um, like a finite number of, of these like distances that you can chain together to to get a total uh, maximum uh, uh, distance between any two uh, f of uh, f sub n of x's and y's. S um, uh, um, actually, let me let me just go on. <laughs> sorry, I think I um, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. Okay, you take the you, know, you so k is compact. Okay. So cover um, cover k with with delta neighborhoods. Cover k with um, neighborhoods of radius delta. Then um, there exists a finite subcover. N delta xi. So <coughs> now we have that um, these guys were pointwise bounded. The Fn were pointwise bounded. Okay. So um, so at each at each x of i, you have um, you know you have this. There's some there exists some mi uh, such that all the f sub n's at that point are, are less than mi. Okay, so this is this is the picture here, right? You've got your set, um, you've got your set, right? And you've got <coughs> a finite subcover x1, x2, x3. Right. You've got some finite subcover here, right? And you know that each one of these, at each one of these points, there is a, a bound for all the functions, right? There's a bound for all the functions at that at that point. Okay. Right. Right. But then, um, what do you you can you can get a, a uniform bound on the whole space. Right? How do you do it? Take the Just take the max, right? So let uh, m be the max of the mi, which would bound it at, which would bound all the functions at these three points, right? But then you, Mia, yes. So the mi, you're referring only to the bounds for the x's that are in the finite subcover. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. Okay. 
So that would give us a bound for the functions at each of these at each of these points. What about points that are not at these center dice? They're all included in an epsilon neighborhood around this point. That's right. That's right. They all live in the delta neighborhood, so their values will not vary by more than epsilon from from this. Right. So we, we need to add on epsilon. Right. So then, um, <coughs> right. Then for any x and k, we see that fn of x is going to equal to um, fn x minus fn xi plus fn xi for some, uh, which is less than or equal to fn x minus fn xi plus fn xi. Right. And if we choose um, choose xi to be the, the one that's closest so that the distance between x and xi is less than delta, right? you choose the, choose the closest center so that you are um, Within the delta ball, right? Um, within the delta ball around that xi, then this is going to be um, less than um, epsilon plus n by a continuity, right? This is by a continuity, and this is how we chose our n. Or actually, I, I just need my m here. Right? I should say this it's less than epsilon plus mi, which is. Uh, which is less than or equal to the MWHS. I'm confused why you had to do that last step after you just chose the max. Like you, you set your M, and I thought that would kind of finish the proof. <coughs> well, just to show that that M actually works, right? We wanted to show that um, we want to show that uh, Fn. We can find a bound for Fn x. Right. We want to show that you know, that the, the the absolute value of fn x is controlled for every every <coughs> every x and every n, right? And so you say, okay, well, if this point x has to lie in the delta neighborhood of one of the xi, choose that xi, then we found this thing by by this, which is controlled by echo continuity plus plus how we chose the chose the m. I mean, I mean, it's true. It's sort of true that you know, once you do this, you know, the the rest is is easy, right? I mean, if you know what you're doing, then you can. It's sort of obvious what you do afterwards. But to be complete, you should write it out. Okay, everybody, everybody, getting it? Any questions so far? Okay, so that gives us the first part, <coughs> that the f sub n's are, are uniformly bounded on k. And now we want to get the second part, that fn has a uniformly convergent subsequence. So here's the second part, and again, now my picture looks like this. So I don't know if that 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 will be meaningful. Okay. So um. Uh, <coughs> okay. So we're going to start off with the following fact, which maybe I'll just say is an exercise, and it's, it's not not difficult. Exercise. Um, K is a compact metric space. Then there exists a countable dense subset E sitting inside of K. Okay. 
kind of guess how you would do this, right? You would just cover every point, cover every point in K with um, balls of radius one, and then cover every point in K, and then, and then take, um, sorry, take the centers of those balls. I'm sorry. You would <coughs> take a finite subcover and then take the centers of those balls. That, that would be your first collection of, of, that would give you a finite number of points, right? And then you do that um, with radius one over, one, one over two, do the same thing, cover, take a finite subcover, choose the centers. That gives you some more, you know, a, another finite set of points. And you keep on doing this and you get a, 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 a countable set of points that you can make converge to any point in, in your set. So that's, that's basically the proof right there. Um, okay. So, um, uh, so you've got this uh, compact metric space. You know that it has a countable dense subset. And <coughs> um, you use the result that we had last time um, uh, by previous theorem. Um, there exists a subsequence at NK that is pointwise convergent. On e. <coughs> okay. And it'll turn out that this this subsequence is the subsequence that we want. Okay. We're looking for a uniformly convergent subsequence. This is this actually turns out to be it. So plain this subsequence is actually uniformly convergent. Okay. So <coughs> start off in this um, <coughs> so you start off in the same same way. Um, uh, we're gonna wanna show, so we wanna show using the Cauchy, Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence that um, given epsilon, there exists some n such that um, if k and l are greater than n and x is in k, then f and k x minus f and l x is smaller than epsilon. That's that's just the Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence. Okay, so um, <coughs> we fix our epsilon, and again we use. We, this, this proof, this part of the proof is pretty similar to the first part. Okay, so you say um, uh, by echo continuity again, there exists some delta such that, you know, blah, 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 right? Same, same thing as before, such that if the distance between two points is less than delta, then the distance between, um, the distance between the outputs is, is less than, Less than epsilon. Okay. So, <coughs> okay. So then, um, uh, uh, cover every point in E with um, with delta balls. Since since E is dense, since E is dense, uh, since E is dense, uh, this also covers this also covers K. Right. Now K is compact, so there exists. 
compactness there exists a finite subcover the i i from one to one to p and a finite subcover of k Yes, whenever. Does this uh, finite subcover also cover E? Well, E is, e is contained in K, so yes. Yeah. So by dense, like the denseness, it has to cover K? Yeah, yeah. Because um, <coughs> right, every, every point in K is either part of E or is a limit point of E, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, if you cover every every point of E with, if you cover every point of E, you're gonna hit, you're gonna cover all of K, because right? you hit the limit points as well. So, um, okay. So, why don't you just put, um, forget about E and just cover K with, Delta balls to be kind of the same. Is there a reason why you make a new set of E that's just the greater point? It's because we needed we needed E um, to have to create a point a pointwise convergence uh, sequence first. Oh, okay. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. okay. So <coughs> at this point, we've covered K. Right. This K. E one. Right. Right. And um, the F sub N K's converge pointwise on, on these on these on these points. Um, so um, right, so F N K um, converges pointwise on E. So there exists some n such that um, if k and l are bigger than n, then um, f n k e i minus f n l e i is smaller than epsilon. know that <coughs> we know that on each of these points the the subsequence converges right on each of these on each of these center points the subsequence converges right and so um, we can uh, we can choose some n that works for um, That works for for all of all of these points. Right? You just choose you choose an n n that works at e one. You choose an n that works at e two, et cetera, et cetera. And this n will be the max of all those of all those n i. Okay. So and then we do basically the same same thing as before. We say well, then for any x and k. Um, if k and l are bigger than n, then um, fn k x minus fn l x is less than or equal to um, fn k x minus fn k e i. Right. Again, you choose the um, choose. 
xi say that um, x lies in the delta neighborhood of xi. I'm sorry, choose ei, sorry, such that x lies in the neighborhood of, of the delta neighborhood of ei. Okay. Uh, this is less than or equal to this minus n l ei plus fnl ei minus fnl x. And these guys are these these this first and last term is controlled by absolute um, by equicontinuity. So we get we get three epsilon. Okay. These first and last terms are controlled by equicontinuity, <coughs> and this middle term <coughs> this middle term um, is is because of because of the, because of your choice of n. So that that does it for you. Okay. You found you found the n so that for every point um, for every point in K, as long as we're past as long as we're past that n, um, um, the difference between these two things is less than less than epsilon. I mean it's three epsilon, but we could go through and replace everything by epsilon over three. Questions. I feel like maybe this wasn't as clear as I had hoped. Yeah. I, I think this is maybe a silly question, no. but I'm not sure why this applies to all of k rather than just e. Because even though, so the neighborhoods around those points mm -hmm. they cover e, so they also cover the rest of k. Mm -hmm. So because of the density. Because of the density. Yeah. Oh, it's because we're only actually using e. Okay, yeah. It's kind of back to what Alex <coughs> asked earlier. I'm not. I'm still not really sure why you have to have the subset E in K for this to work. Um, how do we get our? How did we get our functions? Our, how did we get our subsequence? Right. You you start off with a sequence of functions. You're looking for a subsequence that converges uniformly. Right. Um, what we what we did the other the last class was use the diagonal process to show that if you had um, a countable set of points, then you could find a pointwise convergent subsequence on that on that set of points. Okay, and so that's what we're doing here. We take our we take our compact set, and we choose um, choose by this exercise a countable a countable just some sort of countable dense subset. Okay, you got these these dots everywhere, and then you create your from the previous, mm. from the theorem we did last time, you get a, a pointwise convergent subsequence. And so all those points are E. Mm. Those guys are E. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And what we want to see is that <coughs> um, uh, we want to see that, right? We want to see that given an epsilon, there's an n such that we can make um, uh, past this time. We can make the difference between um, these values less than epsilon for every for every x and k. Okay, and so you say, okay, well, um, on the on the on the dense subset, on the dense subset, you can do that, right? I'm sorry, not on the dense subset, on the um, on the um, the centers. That come from the come from the finite subcover. Okay. Okay. So you take you, you cover you cover E with with um, with these delta neighborhoods from the equicontinuity, 
and then you <coughs> say, well, because of density, you cover in K also, so you can take a finite subcover, right? So there's only a, there's only a few points here. One, two, three. Um, right? And then you say, well, look, um, because there's only three points, we can make the the subset um, uh, behave as we want to on those points. Okay, we can make this make it make this subsequence can behave as we want to on those points only, right? So for all for all i, right? i plus one to p. Okay, and then we say, well, what about what about um, what if we're not in that? What if we're not there? What if we're not at one of these center points? Well, if we're not at one of those center points, by equicontinuity, we're not that far away, right? We're not that far away. So, you know, the difference is, is going to be just two more epsilons. We just need to add on two more epsilons. Adding on more epsilons is, is, is no trouble. We just divide by whatever number we get, you know. Yeah, I, I should change everything to over three and uh, make this an epsilon at the end. Right. Okay, so, you know, that's that's it. You know, we're, we're, we we show that it works at these at these at this finite number of center points, right? And then we say, well, anybody anybody else is still close enough. I hope that was I hope that's a little bit better. <coughs> Any questions? Any questions? Yes, whenever. So. Back to E is dense. Um, why we if we find a uh, cover like cover E and also cover K? Every point in K is a limit point of E. It's either in E or it's a limit limit point of E. Okay. Okay. So what does that mean? <coughs> uh, if it's in E, then we then we covered it already. Mm -hmm. Okay. If it's not in E, then it's a limit point of E, and that means that there are uh, there are points that are within every radius, mm -hmm. right? There are points of E within every radius. So if, if here's my point, in, here's my point in K. I know that within one distance there's got to be a point in E. Within half distance there's got to be a point in E, and so on and so forth, right? Well, we've just covered we've just covered E with delta neighborhoods, right? So there's, there's, <coughs> um, uh, take the take the delta over two neighborhood, say, of delta over two neighbor. I mean, just take the delta over two neighborhood of this of this point. You know, there's a point of E in there, right? And if you look at the delta neighborhood of that point of E, then it covers your point of K, right? So, right, everybody, it's it's simply because um, K is either. It's limit points of E or points of E. Okay. Any other any other questions? Okay. Okay. So we have half an hour, um, which could be enough to get one more theorem in. Um, <laughs> you you, you, uh, you don't look pleased. Um, <laughs> you don't look pleased. Um, what should I say? It's a pretty long one. It's a long one. It's a long one, but it's 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 it has very important ideas in it. Um, very important ideas, like like you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do. It. <laughs> Who is yawning? <laughs> Yawning of excitement. Yawning from excitement. It happens. It's like crying when you're happy. That that happens. Yeah, I actually don't believe that. <laughs> 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 I, my sister and I cry every time we laugh. <laughs> How often do you cry, Professor? How often do I cry? There's, there's, it um, must be more, more recent than I'm thinking. Um, when you're at your back. No. <laughs> no. 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 I, I, I can't. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I'm, I'm known as the crybaby in my family. So, 
clearly I must cry more than I think I do. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> okay. So, still wires for us. Okay. So, here we go. Um, Still trying to think of the answer to your question, Jonah. But I, anyway, um, <coughs> I don't think it's more than once a year or every couple of years. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, given any function uh, that's continuous on a <coughs> closed and bounded interval. Um, there exists a sequence of polynomials, a sequence p sub n of polynomials that converges uniformly to f, to f on a, b. So <coughs> another way of phrasing this, you remember that um, when we looked at the space of continuous bounded functions on, a, on, a, on an interval, we defined a metric using the soup norm, right? You define the soup norm, <coughs> you define the soup, soup norm metric, and convergence with respect to that metric meant uniform convergence, was the same thing as uniform convergence, right? So what this is saying is that polynomials form a dense subset of, of C of the complex of the continuous functions. Okay, so just re to rephrase it, um, uh, the space of polynomials, the space of polynomials on AB is dense in CAB with respect to the soup norm metric. Okay. So this is a this is a density, this is really a density statement. Okay. So <coughs> start off the proof. And I'm going to do some things to make it simpler. Uh, so without loss of generality, we'll assume that uh, AB is actually 0, 1. Uh, you can just scale, scale your variables and you know, slide them around to, uh, you know, and translate them to, to make this happen. Um, and we'll also assume that um, We'll also assume that f of 0 and f of 1 are 0. Okay. So we'll assume that you know, our function you know, has, has zero, at the, 0 at the endpoints. Because if we can do it for this, if we, can, if we have some other function, then we can just subtract off the line from it. You can subtract off the polynomial from it, and then, and then get the polynomial approximation down here, and then add the line back on at the end. Okay, so that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't cost us anything. And it will make things simpler. And the third thing we're going to do is that um, we'll pretend that f is 0 outside of um, 0, 1. Okay. And we can just assume that. It, we, it's, it's not even defined outside of zero one, so we just think that think that it's zero on the outside. Okay, so it's and the result of this is that it'll be uniformly continuous on all of R. Yeah. 
it's already uniformly continuous here, but we can, we're going to think of it as a function on all of R by extending it as a constant. Right? So our function looks like this, and we just pretend that it's flat elsewhere. Okay. That'll, that'll, that'll be convenient for us. OK. OK, so here we go. Um, <coughs> Uh, yeah. So um, that's what we're going to do. Let Q sub n of x, we're going to define something called, um, we'll create something called an approximation of the, of the identity. Approximation right, of the identity. Okay. An approximation of of the number one. Okay. Um, but this number one is not the number one that you that you, you're thinking of. It's the number one being the Dirac Dirac delta function. Okay. And um, uh, well, let, let me let uh, let me get I'll get to that in a second. Okay. So. So we'll create something called an approximation of identity. That's these Q, Q sub n guys. Okay. So let Q sub n be um, C, n, C sub n, uh, 1 minus x squared quantity to the n on negative 1, 1. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Where C sub n is defined as the definite integral from negative 1 to 1 of 1 minus x squared to the n dx to the negative 1. Okay. If you <coughs> um, if you look at these guys, uh, 1 minus x squared to the n, well, the first guy is just 1 minus, 1 minus x squared, right? And then the second guy, you know, one minus x squared quantity squared, starts to look like look like this, and then they become more and more like bunched up. They become um, like they become more and more like a like a point. Okay. Um, now we've chosen uh, we've chosen the C sub n so that when you integrate this, right? So notice that if you integrate from negative one to one. Q and X, what do you get? Well, the C sub n is chosen to be 1 over the integral of this, right? So you're just going to get 1, right? That's, that's, that's why we chose C sub n this way. So that when you integrate it, <coughs> right, you're just going to get 1, you're just going to get 1 over the integral <coughs> times, times the integral itself, right? So you get 1. So we've created these guys so that um, they don't they don't shrink like this, but they actually get taller. Right? The next one will be a little bit taller. The next one will be taller, and they all have they all have area one. Okay, they all have area one, but their supports the support of the function is is becoming smaller and smaller, right? Or at least the the amount of meat of the function is is getting bunched up near zero. So um, those of you who know what the Dirac delta function is, this is basically something that um, uh, approaches the Dirac delta function. Right? The Dirac delta function is, is this non-existent function that has an integral of one, right? Has an integral of one, but it's it has no 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 value. It's, it's zero everywhere off of the off of the origin. Okay, that's not really a function. There's no such thing. It's, it's something called a distribution, um, but uh, these um, these things are. You want to think of these guys as approaching that approaching that impossibility. So it's like at zero, it's just infinitely high. Right, right. It's somehow like infinitely. It has a mass of one, but that mass is located only at one point. Okay, and it's something that physicists use. Um, before mathematicians told them it was not, not possible to use it. Um, um, 
And then, you know, mathematicians created a whole theory of distributions that encompasses these things. Okay. I don't know if that's really true, but I, I'll continue to give my fake history <laughs> as I please. <laughs> okay. So. <coughs> okay. So. Um, okay. So three things happen, or maybe just two. Observe. One is that the integral qn is one. Two is that. Um, uh, for any delta, any delta between 0 and 1, mm -hmm. q sub n goes to 0 uniformly on this set. Um, so if this is 0, there's 1 and negative 1, delta and negative delta. Um, on this on this set here, on this set here, the q sub n as as you go as n as n goes to infinity, um, the 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 q sub n go to zero uniformly on these sets. So it's like um, <coughs> get smaller and higher, and it it, it it goes uniformly to zero here. Um, I don't think we have time. I'm going to skip some of the details, so um, let me just let me just skip that. So uh, check it. Okay. Okay. So let me just uh, let me just get the ideas across because these are pretty pretty important ideas. Okay. So um, <coughs> define P n x. So these are going to be the polynomials. Okay. We create the polynomials by taking the integral um, Taking this integral, okay. okay. Now think like this: if if this thing were replaced with the Dirac delta function, okay. the Dirac delta function says, you know, I'm nothing except when t is equal to zero, and at that point, I give you a mass of one. Okay, I give you a mass of one. So when you're integrating against it. Well, you're, nothing, you're not going to get anything except when t equals 0. So you, what you would get is f of x. OK, what you would get is f of x. So that's how you want to think of this. As n goes to infinity, you know, these guys start looking more and more like the Dirac delta function. And in the, in the end, they actually recover your function back. OK, so that's why this thing these guys are approximations of the identity, the identity being, being the thing that you, uh, this process is called con convolution. If you've seen it in, in uh, you might have seen something like it in, in differential equations class in using the Laplace transform. Um, um, <coughs> the Dirac delta function is the identity object in the algebra of convolution. So you convolve against the Dirac delta function and you get back your original function. Right, just like multiplying by one gives you your original number back. Okay, so that's that's why this is called approximation of the, of the identity. Okay. So that's that's the idea. We create this thing that is we create these these things that you know, uh, approach the Dirac delta function. Would that be the the integral of f of x, or is that p n of x actually is equal to f of x? It would actually be equal to f of x, but um, well, I see. Like as the direct, as you approach the direct delta function, you could just get. It looks like you get the integral from negative one to one of f of x, not just f of x. Well, it'll be zero everywhere else, and then you know at that point when t is when t is zero, you get this massive one, mm -hmm. 
and you get multiplied by one, and so that gives you that gives you f of x itself. Okay. I mean, this is this is only true in some sort of. I mean, it's it's actually true, but right now it's only true in some sort of hand wavy sense. But this statement, um, you know, this statement will actually be true that we can. These guys will actually converge uniformly to, to f. Okay. So, okay. So, um, okay. So, <coughs> okay. So, let's see if we can get it. Um, so, I'm, I'm just going to say something. Uh, it's easy to see, and if, if we have time at the end, I'll do it. It's easy to see that these p sub n are polynomials in x. And in fact, let me just do it quickly. Um, so p sub n x, right, is this integral from k to 1 to 1. That that's the Q and T right? Um, now, um, the domain of F is 0, 1. The domain of F is 0, 1. So we need X plus T to lie in, um, to lie between 0 and 1, right? So that means that t ranges, t actually ranges from negative x to 1 minus x. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite, rewrite this. This is going to be negative x to 1 minus x. Okay, t, t, t. Okay, Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So. Okay. Then you do a change of variables. Um, <coughs> you do a change of variables on it, and you can see that this thing is actually um, can be written like this. Remember what these guys are. Q sub n of t minus x is just um, c sub n 1 minus quantity t minus x squared to the n. Right. So you end up with this. <coughs> If you think about it, if, if you integrate this thing out, you're just going to get um, uh, you're going to get a polynomial in x, right, of degree two to the n. I mean, there'll be some there'll be some numbers you, when you integrate the t's out. Uh, you're going to get some numbers, but if you think about it, this thing is just a polynomial in, in x with powers of powers of x um, ranging from zero to two n. Okay. Um, okay. So that's why those guys are are polynomials. Um, now, let me see if I can actually show you how this all works. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so I want to show that the keys of n converge to f uniformly. In other words, uh, 
if we fix epsilon, we want to show there exists an n such that um, if we are past that n, then p n x minus f of x is smaller than epsilon right, for all x in our domain. Okay. Right, we've got we've got some crazy um, continuous function, and we want to sh so show that there's a polynomial that <coughs> lies within an epsilon tube. Right? Whatever epsilon tube we take of that polynomial, there's a, a, of that function, there's a polynomial that lies within it. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So. Uh, wait. If we look at this difference, well, by definition, it's just the integral from negative one to one of x plus t q n t dt minus f x. So that's just by definition. Okay. At this point, we play a funny trick, which is we <coughs> we slide the uh, the f of x inside the integral. Okay. And the reason we can do that is because uh, the integral of q was one, right? So you know, we, if we wanted, we could write you know, over here, integral of q, right? Multiply that, just, and then we put this thing inside, and then we can combine them, okay? So we're just using the fact that the integral of q is one. This sort of trick happens a lot. Um, and you see that that's gonna allow us to exploit the continuity, or the uniform continuity of, of f. Right. We have that's something we have control over. Okay. So um, <coughs> now, uh, by triangular equality, that's less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of this q and t dt. And I can get rid of these things because Q is positive. Okay. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this into two parts. Um, <coughs> um, on each of which I'll have a different sort of control that, that, that we use. Okay. So we split it into um, <coughs> the part where where t is less than e in less than or equal to delta, and the part so that plus the part where um, t is bigger than delta. And um, on each of these parts, we have a different sort of control. <coughs> In this first part, we're going to use the uniform continuity, uniform continuity of f. In the second part, we're going to use the fact that the, the <coughs> approxim approximation of the identity converges to zero uniformly on, on sets like these. The, the second property of, of the approximation of the identity. So <coughs> by uniform continuity, since f is uniformly continuous, we can choose <coughs> delta so that t being less than delta means that f of x plus t minus f of x is smaller than epsilon over t. So I probably should have written that up here, right? So we choose that delta, and then we split the integral according to that delta that we just chose. So 
say split, split using that delta. Okay, so <clears throat> what does that give us? Well, this thing here is smaller than epsilon number two, so we get epsilon number two, the integral of Q and T. Right, we can just pull out, pull out that number. Okay. We got this thing is smaller than epsilon number two. It's bounded by epsilon number two times this. We pull out the epsilon number two. Okay. Um, now we've got this other part. So we're going to do something, something crude. <coughs> we will <coughs> say, well, um, we know that this is smaller than two times m where m is uh, an upper bound for the absolute value of f on 0, 1, right? So just use the triangle inequality in a very crude way. You know, this is smaller than two, 2 times that upper bound, right? Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, we have uniform. We have uniform convergence here, right? Um, so we have. Uh, so by uniform convergence, um, right. right. Uh, so let me write it like this. This is less than or equal to two m times the integral of q and t dt over this, over this interval. Right. Okay. Almost there, almost there. Um, <coughs> now, qn goes to zero uniformly on this, on this interval here. Okay, so, so the limit as n goes to infinity of this integral equals <coughs> the integral of the limit, but the integral of the limit is zero, right? The limit, the limit of the function is zero, so we get zero. Um, <coughs> so, just choose uh, here. Choose n such that n bigger than n implies that um, the integral of qn t dt is less than epsilon over 4m. <coughs> okay, and so <coughs> you see what you get that for n bigger than or equal to that n, we see that this thing here star um, star is less than uh, less than epsilon over 2 times 2n times epsilon over 4n which is epsilon like this. Oh, yeah, I yeah, think thanks. Okay. Um, okay. 
I, sorry to rush through that. I think, so that, the stone wire stress will not be on your exam. <laughs> will not be on your exam, but Ascoli Arzala will be. Okay. 